Thanks, Brian. Thanks, uh, folks, for <laughs> being with us. We would love to just kind of start a conversation about this topic. It is one that's uh, near and dear to our hearts. Um, I would maybe start on the outset by saying, beware of what you're starting if you encourage your kids to sing at home. <laughs> because once they start, they don't stop. Uh, there is a lot of music making and a lot of singing in this household. And it is mostly wonderful and sometimes uh, a little on the crazy side. Yes. So, uh, no, but we love it. We have kids who love to sing. Um, can, I, you, can you all hear us? Can you Fine. hear us pretty well? Okay, good. Okay. Super. We're using Jana's fancy mic. I just got a new microphone, so I got to make sure it's working. Um, so I, I'm going to just start with like just a, a few initial thoughts that kind of come from my perspective um, of leading corporate worship um, for many years now. And I'm actually going to paste in the chat box. If, if this is your jam right here, about seven years ago, I actually wrote an, uh, a blog post for our church. It was really more of a rant. Or a soapbox, you soapbox. might call it. Yeah. Yes. Um, and that was because another worship pastor asked me about how I think about vocal range and corporate singing and things like that. Um, and it led to just my rant. So this is something I'm passionate about um, as, a, as a worship pastor and a worship leader. I have been for many years and now I'm in the place where I'm hiring other worship leaders and training them. So um, I just wanna share a few thoughts there because it's out of this that kind of, uh, there's kind of an overflow of that that goes into kind of our home life and our singing life and our, our worshiping life as a family. Um, I think the first thing I just want to say is that, that singing is a form of discipleship. And, um, and I mean that by a couple different, uh, in a couple different ways. First of all, I think singing in worship um, gives you tools to take how you're being discipled in church and to take it home with you during the week. Um, and that that's true in a lot of different ways, but um, you know, it singing has a way to evoke uh, memory and memorization in a really strong way that is significant and important. Um, and actually, when I think about the type of sort of musical diet that our congregation is getting, I'm thinking very much about um, how that music will disciple them during the week. Now we could do a whole thing on on text and theology, but that's not really the, the point of this conversation. Um, but I want to talk to you for a minute just about the concept of melody. Um, and melody, kind of simply put, is just the arrangement of notes and rhythms that creates, creates a musical phrase. Um, and I am always working from a standpoint as a worship pastor where I want to give our people not just a diet of good, theologically rich, worshipful words to say, but memorable melodic music that they can take home with them. Um, one real easy test of a good melody is um, if you sing a song in church uh, that you never sang before, um, if you come home about four hours later, can you actually remember any of it by yourself? Uh, and the other gift of, of melody, besides it's the way that you can just simply remember uh, music better and therefore the words better uh, when you um, have a good melody is, it's also something that's very reproducible um, for the individual or the family at home. So um, if, um, if, if a piece of music requires a huge orchestra and an organ and a choir to be effectively sung, or if it requires a full rock band with the right sort of percussive underlay, um, that means I'm dependent on singing that song on Sunday in church by the help of a, of a large musical ensemble. But if it's got a beautiful, simple, memorable melody, that's something I can take home and sing in the shower, sing while I'm doing dishes. Uh, with my with my family, so kind of one of the, the the very heart of our kind of vision is uh, around melody in church, and that comes home uh, in how we kind of disciple our kids as well. 
I, I would also just say with that, that um, melody and simple melody, that's not overly rhythmically comp uh, complicated or old, overly complicated in terms of range, also elicits singing from a congregation. So one of our goals always in worship um, is not just to sing good stuff, but to really release our people to sing with us, to sing along. Um, so that's the kind of musical diet we try to have as a congregation. Um, and when that happens at church, uh, you take that home with you and it starts to happen at home. Um, but that's also how we think about um, what we're singing with our, with our kids um, at home. Um, there can be challenges, I think I said, to um, either end of the spectrum. Either end of the spectrum. So on the sort of more contemporary side, the challenge is often one uh, ab about rhythmic um, singing. There's just a high level of, of complicated rhythms often in contemporary worship music. That can create a challenge in terms of just remembering it and taking it with you. Um, I would say on the hymn side of things, often you have simpler um, melody, but you that verse form with just all those words can be a huge challenge as well. So uh, we, we can talk a little more even about navigating that kind of music, but one of the things we just kind of want to dive into is um, kind of the restoration in yeah your family life even of simple, basic uh, melodies and just really simple music and, and the way that that elicits family singing, uh, which in turn engages your family in singing in the context of worship. So just really quickly about discipling your family by singing. So not only, sorry, I thought someone said something. Um, um, not only is, uh, is music, um, not only do we need to disciple our, our family um, in singing so that they kind of learn the truths that we're singing, but we, there's actually a little bit of discipleship just involved in teaching your family to be a singing family. Um, so the first thing you can just do is disciple in the family practice of singing. I mean, one way I might put it is that if, if you don't kind of sing throughout daily life as a family, um, it's unlikely that your kids will just kind of turn on the singing switch when they get to church on Sunday or turn on the singing switch in front of the TV during a live stream. Um, and to that extent, I just wanna say, don't, if you're a parent of a child who just isn't singing with you on the live stream, don't be overly discouraged by that. Um, the first thing I would say is you sing during the live stream. Um, and that is discipleship in and of itself because you're discipling your kid by what you do. Um, lots of research shows that a kid's connection to the life of the church in general is very related to the experience they see their parent have. So being actively involved as a singer in, in uh, worship, be it live stream or in person, or just being involved in the service is discipling your kids in this. Um, and the other place you can start is not kind of like overly kind of trying to force your kids to participate. And believe me, I've been there. Um, we've I haven't, done, we've done it all. <laughs> um, I, um, but it's actually to start discipling them simply by singing around the house and just making singing a part of your life. Um, so sing while you do dishes, sing, uh, sing as you kind of just go through your day, the songs that capture you in worship, uh, sing them throughout the day, but it's not even just about singing, the, the church songs. It's just about singing in general. Um, and this doesn't require professional musicianship. I see my sisters on the call here. Hi, Bev. Um, we grew up with a mom who didn't have any kind of formal music training or anything, but she just loved to sing. And she sang church songs and Bible songs and silly songs and all kinds of things. And it just, it just created a singing culture in our, in our family. So the idea of singing once we were in worship was natural because that's what we did at home. And that's what our parents uh, modeled to us. Did I? Good? So can I interject I here? What? Go ahead, Brian. Can I interject here? So Please. one thing I forgot to introduce you guys is tell us about the ages of your kids. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. our and, oldest just um, 18, which I can't 
believe he'll be going to college. He'll be graduating from high school. And then we have 14, eighth grade, um, 11, fifth grade, and our, those are all boys. And then our daughter is eight and she's in third grade. Um, and they all, I'm going to get to like what we've done for music education in our family in a little bit, but they all do music as an extracurricular activity. And no, my oldest is not planning on being a music major next year at school. In fact, he has voiced no interest in doing anything musical in college, which is honestly very surprising to me. And I bet you he's going to be there for two months and realize he needs to do something. This is one of those hands-off parenting yeah, we're moments. we're just like, we're, yeah, yeah, we're, yeah. We're, we're, we're out. Yeah, we're out. <laughs> yeah. he's going to miss it because he does, he does, he does so, so much, much yeah. music. I don't, and he is an amazing musician. I don't know if he realizes it yet. Um, yeah, and I, I just don't think he knows. So, um, okay, so that's Steve's so soapbox. That Did that answer your question, Brian? Are we good? Yeah, it does. And I guess I was, uh, as you were talking about singing throughout your day, I don't know if you want to go on engine or not, but uh, I, I can imagine, you know, little kids singing throughout the day, maybe, but I'm, I'm having a hard time imagining the older kids singing throughout the day. Oh my gosh, that they sing all day that long. There's a, my 14 year old is an obsessive hummer. So that's, <laughs> that's one thing that we have going on, which I have had piano students who are obsessive hummers. And it's a particular personality type. Um, I, I mean, I, I would just say too, yeah, like they were doing it when they were younger. And so I feel like it's continued. So like, if you've got a teenager at home that doesn't sing throughout yeah, their it's day, probably not going to start I, now. And I don't, but I don't even think that's the goal because I still think there's the opportunity to model just a life of singing um, to a teenager. So once again, the parents singing um, throughout their day, I think has a, 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 an influence on that teenager as well. Okay, we're gonna come back to all yeah. that. I'm gonna step on my soapbox now, which is I have a lot of experience with early childhood music. And um, in a lot of my training, I was given a lot of really great little tidbits. Um, the first is that the human ear develops, like its actual growth is primarily from the age, like it's like, here's birth. And then at the age of three, that, that development spikes. And then it kind of levels off again around age six or age seven. And so if you think about it, um, you know, obviously babies and toddlers learn to talk, but if you think about your own kids when they really were speaking and able to kind of, if they sing on pitch, able to sing on pitch, it's probably developing the most quickly between three and six as those, those ages. And, um, and so that's the biggest window to grab. If you're past that, no shame. But if you have young kids or if you haven't had your kids yet, that's the age to do the most in your home. Um, you do not have to pay for an expensive music education curriculum, but if you have the finances to do something in an early childhood program at that age, I do really recommend it, especially if there's a really high quality program in your area. Um, and if you're not going to pay for classes, then at the very least get some really good quality folk music, chill, other children's music, um, Bible songs that are that age appropriate. And again, um, range and simplicity is very important. Um, the ideal range for a younger child to sing in is if you're a musician, you know where middle C is on the piano, the ideal range is from D right next to C up to B, that sixth, that interval of a sixth. And that's not to say that younger kids can't sing below D or above B. It just means that's where their uh, voice is going to be most comfortable and most able to move around. Mm. And the question I get asked all the time is, my child doesn't sing on pitch. Well, singing on pitch is a two-part thing. It's the ability to hear, and then it's the ability to physically within your voice box and your breath support to match that pitch. And barring um, you know, actual physical disabilities, taking that aside, I really do strongly believe that every child can be taught to match pitch. And I have literally taught tens of children, if not hundreds of children to sing on pitch, taking kids who literally did not move their voice at all from a single monotone to being able to sing correctly on pitch. Mm. Because I was taught how to do that in the, the curriculum. I taught in the Yamaha music education 
curriculum or system for many years. And that's where I did most of that. Um, so I, I really just feel very strongly that that's um, our culture has lost some of our understanding of this. I'm gonna blame American Idol, although I'm sure that um, there were some causes way before this. Um, but we have developed this idea in our culture that some people are singers and everyone else is not. Mm -hmm. And that's frankly completely untrue. And if you're a music educator and you're familiar with Suzuki's work at all, the idea that all children hold music within them and it's the teacher's job to, to train their ear and draw it out, I would 100% affirm that and being able to sing on pitch is part of that. Now, that said, if you've gotten past that window and you've got a child who's more like age 10 and up and they're not yet matching on pitch, it's going to be much harder at that point to develop that in them be, for many reasons, but physical as well as social, they're, they're aware now of what they sound like and what other people think and all of that. So it's a complex, thing but all i have to say just if you don't hear anything else from me on the music ed end of it just hear me say that every child at birth mm. should be able to ultimately sing on pitch when they do it is of course um you know different for every kid um and then i will just i i have a handout i'm gonna link a pdf in the chat in just a second i did just put a handful of my top recommended music curricula for early childhood in particular to check out um, things like music art and kinder music and Yamaha and Suzuki. Um, but when you if you're looking for a curriculum for your younger child, especially like kindergarten and below, you want to look for something that incorporates music and movement together. Mm -hmm. um, and there's all this research around um, the development of the vestibular function, which is your inner ear. So if you get nauseous, like I do, if you get motion sick, um, that's actually an inner ear function. And that's all related to how our bodies move, our balance system and music and movement together develop that really well in young children. Um, okay. Yeah. Do you wanna add to that? Nice, like join my soapbox to your soapbox. Please. Put them together as two bonded soapboxes. Mm -hmm. um, I was just gonna say, um, for our parents out there, our wonderful parents too, um, if you aren't confident in your singing or you don't sing on pitch. Oh, um, wait, I get to say this because this is my fact. Jana has something to tell you. It does not matter. Yeah. All of the research says that it has nothing to do with the quality of your voice or whether or not you even sing on pitch. It's the, it, all that matters is if you sing. Yeah. And so if you have friends even who come to you and say, I don't sing on pitch, you just tell them it doesn't matter. Just sing in your house anyway, put on a good CD yep. and sing along, la, 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 wherever you, it is. And, and it doesn't matter. You just yeah. sing. Yeah. Um, and that's why they like informal nature. Also, what you were saying about movement just reminds me of the informal nature of um, just singing as a family um, and just singing throughout your day, how that also impacts your corporate worship setting. So, um, you know, like different families have, um, have like different cultures of prayer. And if you don't, you know, have your kids pray out loud at home, it's probably not very likely that when you get in a, like uh, a larger group with your kids that they're going to, they're going to be the one to volunteer to pray out loud. So the same just applies to singing. Um, and, and doing it in the form, informal ways, even around your house where like your kids are dancing around and, and singing and you're doing that sort of thing. It, it prepares them for a more formalized setting where it's like, now we actually stand in our seat, you know, at, at our seats and, and sing as well. So there's just a, a link to some of you were saying. We're going to stand on the floor. We're not going to stand, stand in, in the our seats. seats. That's if it gets, if it gets pretty rocking on yeah. a Sunday. Yeah. Probably not in the living room as much though. So. Okay, um, so is that um, a do we I think we can go we on. were we were gonna go to another thing unless Brian wanted to interject with a, a well I my interjection is that um this worshiping question. from home thing has actually helped our kids in one little way. Well, maybe some uh, some more, but one way that you just mentioned, the movement thing. Yes, that totally. our girls get up and they can move around and dance, you know. Now I know that you guys go to a church that 
allows just, that in say, church too. My daughter dances yeah. anyway in church, so <laughs> that's not that's not really no, a prohibitive. So, for her. But but my living room was especially accommodating to my kids on Sunday yeah, yeah, when they totally. decided to get up and dance and even pull out their instrument and start playing along, which was kind of a fun, fun yeah. little thing that they've felt yeah. more comfortable to do. Well, and, That's fantastic. And, and even to your question, Brian, I, I, uh, that kind of initiated this, I think, um, you know, I, I haven't been home too much with the kids because I'm usually at church, but um, I think a more informal nature, like even talking with your spouse about it, like, what do you expect your older kids to do? What do you expect your younger kids to do in the live stream setting? I definitely think it's it's just it, like, it's almost impossible to fight for as formal of a of a dynamic with your family. So, yeah, you know- It's unnecessary. Yeah, yeah, it's it's probably not a fight worth fighting because it makes it makes church feel um, like like it's the time mom and dad get really mad at me. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, and, and it does, it does, it does kind of get some, allow for some of that freedom uh, like that you're talking about. We've had, we've seen some of that with our kids as well. Anna, you have your hand raised, but I can't even see your face. Anna has a question. Yeah. Yeah. That's because I'm in bed. Uh, oh, very tired. Hi, Anna. <laughs> Hi, Anna from Philadelphia. <laughs> you can't see my face. Um, but um, I mean, I love early childhood music. We put all of our kids in it, but ever since COVID, obviously that thing's been meeting in person. And I have this like vague sense of like, I'm failing my children. I mean, we listen to a lot of music at home, they dance, but I'm like, what are just easy things to incorporate that aren't, cause I'm just not gonna sit and do like a half hour, like, oh, we're gonna sit around and do music now. Yeah. Um, oh. But I still feel like they're missing out on what they would have had, you know, so I don't know. So we're, I gonna talk, to we're gonna give some specific ideas, but um, I would mostly just say, as long as you have music on regularly that you're singing, that you have a drum available or some sticks. Well, they play it all the time. I'm sure our neighbors yeah. love that, but I, then I think you're probably fine. All right. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I know. I, and truthfully, we did not, with the exception of all of my kids did Yamaha because I was working at the Yamaha school. So once they hit somewhere between four and five, my kids started that program, which is a keyboard based, like learn to play the keyboard program. Prior to that, I did not pay for um, early childhood classes for my kids for, I mean, probably total, maybe I did about four or five semesters total for, for yeah. four children. So I was, I don't think that's 100% necessary if you're able to do some of that at home and you're playing good quality music at home. I mostly did it for myself because I wanted to watch a master teacher teach some of that toddler and, and preschooler program. And, um, and I really enjoyed it, but, but there, there've been whole sets of years. I haven't done anything like that with my kids. Um, I think the one thing I will just say is what you do with your oldest yeah. child yeah. really matters if you have multiple children, because what they take in and then model and do at home really does trickle down. Um, and if they just are enthusiastic about it, which our oldest thankfully always was, you know, then that really does come down the line to the younger kids um, and they can be making music with them. Let's go back to our outline. So let's do you want to say some of this or do you yeah yeah to... I just said kind of do like two other thoughts yeah sure on, um, on what Anna asked one is well, I was just thinking about the COVID experience too your kids are a little young for this Anna yet but like but like our kids actually got into even a little bit more of the like the editing like software side of, of music making which is actually our our 11 year old got way into that and that's been like a fun new exploration that I think is actually benefiting his musicianship oh my gosh um, lining and, up lining up drum beats like yeah. your rhythm has to be yeah. insane if you're gonna line up recorded music so um, so that's been really fun yeah and then the other thing that's like not covid specific but you're in the house more in covid so it's even more is and we haven't always been good at this because we moved and it's been harder to figure out but any musical instruments you do have in the house and i'm sure you're already thinking this anna but like have ways for them to always be out hanging on the so, wall. Or... So like mandolins or or ukuleles or guitars or violins or hand drums, like hang stuff on the wall, have a corner in the in the main living room where you hang out kind of stuff. 
So I just said that my husband, like two days ago, like we need to hang our guitar on the wall yeah, like the Williamses totally. did. So oh, it's huge. It's how, it. Yeah, if it's under their beds, you know, for to pull out, it just won't happen. No. But uh, anyway, that's just another random thought about like music. I just think music culture maybe even more so in the house right now. So and and I'll just also throw out that if you're not a pianist and don't already own a piano having a piano just in the middle of the living room kid every child walks by kids who come over to our house to play walk by and you know plunk 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 across the piano while they come by and our kids would frequently just be doing something else come over bang something out and then go on it's completely outside of practice time so i am fully of the opinion that the piano should always be available um except all the hours that I'm teaching on it or practicing myself, but that it's, it's in the middle of the house. Um, you know, it's not a special thing that's reserved only for special times. Absolutely not. Although sometimes mom and dad are, Oh, I frequently or, tell them or stuff. Nana and Papa need an ear break. <laughs> that's sometimes uh, a reality. Um, okay. So we were going to do a little bit on, um, so some things to think about as you're doing it at home. I think this first point I've basically yeah, already made. down here. Uh, kids do what they see their parents model. We said all that. Okay, so uh, what we did with our younger children. Um, so we think a lot about our oldest guy, Joe, because it feels like kind of like this is the same thing as with baseball. I, I spent a lot of time teaching Joe how to catch and teaching Joe how to hit. And then kind of all of a sudden I looked and my second and my third knew how to catch and hit because they were playing catch with Joe. Um, so there's a lot of time investment often in the first kid for establishing culture. Um, and, and this applies to singing too. And we just did a lot of singing just through everyday life. As I'm saying, one thing, one thing was just like singing in the car. Um, Jana wrote down, which is really true, like repetitive or ritualistic songs. So the idea of having songs that even for a season, you just sing a ton, like it becomes the family obsession is really a good thing for just sort of establishing familiarity with, with singing. Um, or like a bedtime song yeah. or a bath time yeah. song or a good morning song or the a, cleanup song, the cleanup song. Yes. And any good preschool is going to, you know, use these kinds of things to get kids in line for where they're going next. The cleanup song is also helpful when parents are stressed out and kind of angry <laughs> to still present with a pleasant sounding voice. Clean up, clean up. Okay, okay sorry. Um, um, also, see, seasonal, seasonal songs. Seasonal, so like we, every Advent in December, we always sing, oh, come on, come Emmanuel. We, we, light, we light the Advent candles, turn off the lights before dinner, and we just sing one verse of oh, come on, come Emmanuel um, before we eat dinner together. Um, so we incorporate it into our prayers a lot. We sing the doxology a lot as one of kind of like our rotating family prayers. Do you have any other seasonal ones? Uh, ones from church. There's songs from church. Um, you will find if you do ritualistic songs, especially with younger kids, that they will hang on to them like a couple seasons too far. So like you probably notice it with, with Christmas songs, your family sings Christmas songs, and then your five-year-old is still singing them in February and you, you want to go crazy. But just remember in that moment that you are creating a singing culture. Literally my family. eight year old piano student today asked me to play Little Drummer Boy. And I was like, really? It's <laughs> it's February 8th. So kids kids live, you know, long, they, they like the repetition. Um, um, okay, this is, this is kind of really down to some like brass tacks, but um, I was thinking about the fact that we start, you know, kind of like the role of teaching your kid to be sort of an independent singer, which I think in the end has the benefit of um, them engaging in things like corporate worship because they have sort of an independent confidence in their own singing. Um, and some of this was intentional for sure. Some of it was like experimental with our poor oldest child, but I, as a dad, spent some time uh, for you musicians uh, singing with him a lot when he was like in the like three, two, three Preschool. year old range. Yeah. yeah. I would sing a lot up high with him in his octave um, and just helping him sort of gain confidence. And then I literally would start experimenting with, okay, daddy's going to sing lower now and you sing high. And it sounds like a really simple, like kind of silly thing, but it was like his first step, I feel like um, into 
in the idea of like independence, or it can be like sing with mommy up high and dad's going to sing down low and just kind of establishing the idea that we can do different things with our voices and you have your own voice and you can contribute. And this is your what part. any male elementary music teacher is doing yeah. this. They're singing up in their falsetto in the child's range and then eventually moving down. Um, if any of you know Andy Seymour and have ever heard him lead a rehearsal, it's like falsetto city and then he yeah. drops down after half of rehearsal so um yeah and then from there i mean uh we tried to listen to a lot of music and we'll talk about kinds of music we listen to at home as well but we try to listen to things with a lot of good harmony lines so the concept of harmony and if you're musically inclined as a family or even if mom or dad is the idea of like one of them singing one part and one of them singing the other kind of just establishes the idea of family music making and each of us contributing our part um, um, or or dad or mom if they're the only one who really likes to sing listening to a recording of something and switching over to the harmony like all those kinds of things just sort of create the idea of Oh, listen, dad could switch parts or mom could switch parts like um, and that creates a sort of independence in your singing, too. I also am all for silly songs yeah. um, Big and, time. and things that like can lighten the mood if needed. Um, there are a couple of songs from children's albums that we've had that then you find yourself sweeping and you're like, oh, this ridiculous song about sweeping. It's much better to do that than just to be sweeping with no music. Um, and just an added note with that, I would just <laughs> say that um, do both listening to recorded stuff and definitely sing along with it. That's a real gift to your kids. Also sing, the singing throughout your day is also about singing singing without record, uh, played stuff. Um, the idea that this is something we can do on our own establishes that, um, that independence and that culture as well. You wanna say anything about improvisatory? Oh, no. I mean, just like adding your own words into, I mean, Anna's question about what kind of stuff to do with young children at home when you're not doing a music education curriculum, like take a song that you know, switch out words to to make it something different. Um, you know, something like the wheels on the bus go round and round. Well, what else, you know, when you're in the car, what else do we do? The steering wheel goes side to side, the horn goes beep, 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 whatever, you know, just and that that develops creativity as well as way down the road that goes towards music composition. If you can improvise even something as simple as words in a simple song that leads towards you are a music maker and a music creator yourself. Well, and like make up songs too, right? Oh yeah. Just, just make up family songs that didn't exist until you sang them, which will make chores more fun and establish singing culture. Also like, don't be too hard on your kids if they get a little silly with worship songs oh, yeah. and change the words and get goofy with it. I mean, you can do the same kind of parenting where you stop them from saying really inappropriate stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but I, don't think of it as sacrilege. Like I, the words are super important. Don't, don't hear me say that like corporate worship and the theology there isn't important, but I kind of start from the baseline that usually all of us feel that way. But just remember that the music is also important too. Um, and sort of delighting in and experimenting with the music by changing words. It's just them being involved uh, yeah. with it. And I think that's, that's a good thing as well. Yeah. Um, Okay, you got another you got another soapbox to um, jump on. Well, I was just gonna kind of go through how we decided to prioritize music education for our children. And that's not to say that A, you have to do any of the same things that we did or that what we did is right. I just thought it might be helpful for people who do live on a budget, very much so, um, but very much also prioritize music ed for our kids to know kind of what we did. So I mentioned we paid for a few semesters of early childhood toddler and preschool um, classes so that we could have something to do with our child and and so that I could get some curriculum and watch our teacher teach and they're just they're just so fun they're so delightful. And then, like I said, I worked at the Yamaha school so all of our kids went through that program that is a little bit unique and not in every area, and I totally get that that's you know not available to everyone. For me, as a piano teacher who wanted to ultimately teach my child, it was a huge blessing because my children started in a classroom environment and were not just starting one on one with mom in the house. Yeah. And so by the time they went through that program and then started private lessons with me, um, 
I was able, they were already in a groove of practicing and having a regular weekly lesson. So now I teach three out of four of our kids. The fourth goes to a different teacher because personality wise, that is the best choice for us. Um, and so all four of our children take piano. My older two boys both started violin um, in first grade. And my oldest did not take once he hit high school. And our eighth grader is going to stop violin after this year because he picked up trombone um, in fifth grade and he decided for high school, he wants to do band trombone. We never paid a dime for anything for trombone minus the one time a year school fee because we were given a free trombone and um, he's had really good, really good band directors and get some one-on-one -on -one time with them. Yeah. And then um, our kids have all done church choir when there's been children's choir available. And um, so basically what we've paid for is the violin lessons, school fees, which are very minimal for another instrument and the piano lessons for the one kid who doesn't take with me. Yeah. And that's been, that's been about it. If I had less of a budget or if I were not able to teach my own children piano, then we'd be talking about probably taking lessons on one instrument and, you know, um, thinking about um, school music as a supplement. Yeah. I, as a pianist, am terribly biased that piano should be the first instrument taught because it is the instrument that you can see everything theoretically on. It is the keyboard is the instrument on which everything, every instrumental lesson singer has to be able to also play the piano. So it is just what it is. And I'm biased that way. Uh, however, I know wonderful people like Brian's wife who teach Suzuki strings, which is also a very good choice for a younger child because it also develops the ear. Um, and so I think either one of those are good first experiences. If anybody asked me my baseline opinion, I'd say start with piano, but that's, yeah. that's my bias there. Um, and then singing is just always a part of our, our lives. Here's our other soapbox. Do I get to do the soapbox? Yes, but would you have to apologize first if there's any voice teachers in the, in oh, the Zoom call? Oh, well, I'll put it this way. Okay. Um, if you have a teenager and they uh, get interested in singing and they start talking about taking voice lessons, um, That's um, I, we, would, we would definitely encourage, if at all possible, um, ensemble singing first. First. Um, and primarily for primarily. a high school kid. So... First of all, first of all, um, there's usually just, there's so much learning that can go on in like a high school choir where they're going almost every day and they're making, they're making music constantly. They're being fed by all the other singers around them. Uh, they're learning all kinds of skills on a, on a regular basis. Um, not to mention that the, the, the voice is still developing. Um, and, and just back to the subject at hand, if, if, if your desire is to see your kids as they grow up be more and more connected and involved in the corporate life of worship of their church, a choir experience where they're singing with a whole bunch of other people is gonna be way more beneficial towards that goal than learning how to sing as a soloist. There's plenty of time in their young adult and adult life if that's, a, if that's a, an interest they wanna pursue as well. Um, so definitely we would recommend choir and that's in general, like ensemble music making, um, after if they're, if they get to study an instrument like piano, but ensemble music making, in addition to something like studying piano is such a gift to just that whole world of making music with other people, um, which once again, kind of just creates a whole context for, for making music as a member of the congregation. Um, and that's the downfall of the piano. We spend almost all of our time by ourselves um, because we can, because we can play all the notes and fill in all the things. We don't need an accompanist on a regular basis. So, um, but then if you're a really good pianist, maybe you marry a singer because it happens. Something sometimes. about that combination is just dynamite. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> I just don't want to pay an accompanist. Yeah. Sorry. Looks like Brian has a question. Well, 
Well, I just wanted to say I'm glad to hear that you have a brass player in your house. Yeah. We do. He loves it. Player, he has embraced it. He loves it. it. Yeah. I mean, it's he has embraced from day one the philosophy of trombonists just play loud. That's just what we do. We just <laughs> we just play loud. Um, no, he he really he really loves it. I wonder if before you finish up, if you can give us some more um some examples of actual song like yes yep. um early so, on in the talk uh you mentioned like what a good hymn might be what a good yeah. contemporary <laughs> song might be what what are other songs in addition to you know like the doxology what would be a song that i might include as so as if part we, of uh, oh steve wants me to riff real quick um no one can give you some ideas <laughs> We, I, I have a beef with the American Enlightenment, um, which seems way out of left field, but <laughs> being a teacher who very strongly develop, believes in the development of the human ear, I am frustrated with mo modernity and our reliance on the printed word. And, um, and so if your child is doing any kind of music ed, I hope that it's a balancing, balancing act of both learning how to read music as well as learning to develop their ear and play by rote. And so the same would be true in training in, in worship music or training your children to sing. Um, at, we do not, there's no reason to expect a child under the age of 10, maybe nine, maybe eight, if they're a very advanced reader, to be able to read a hymn because A, the vocabulary is very intense. B, I, I, this is how I actually auditioned kids for my choir when I ran children's choir was, do you understand, read through verse one and then go to the next line and read verse one, not go down to line two. It's so complex. Yeah. Um, and so there are hymns with refrains, like especially older gospel hymns. We love refrains. Refrains are the that best. Is like, that is like one thing right there. That, it's always something to hang your hat on. Exactly. So, so, so if the parents can sing through verse and the kids and the kids can join on the refrain, anything that's call and response, where there's a limited line or two of responding to what's been sung first, oh, yeah. the, even the youngest child can hang on to that. Uh, if you go to Res, you know Steve's song, "Oh Lord, Have Mercy," which the only thing the congregation sings is, "Oh Lord, Have Mercy, Have Mercy on Us," and the cantor, which is frequently Steve, sings this litany. And our three-year-old at the time was in Trader Joe's belting at the top of his lungs, oh Lord, have mercy, have mercy on us. And Steve got a little concerned that maybe he would, uh, people would think strangely of him for that. But that's the kind of thing yeah. that kids can grab onto and hang on to. Um, um, I, I was just gonna say really quick, like my earliest memory of singing a hymn in church with my mom was up from the grave he arose. And I... Because I just remember, first of all, I giggled every time we sang the refrain. Um, and, but also just that the the repetitive, joyful nature of that refrain was like, I didn't have to figure out what was going on in the whole hymn. The same words came back with the same melody every single time. So um, we're just, I, we would be huge proponents of, of, of finding things with refrains. Um, okay, now if you want to do hardcore hymns with your kids, then you just have to be willing to say the words or sing the words over and over again. And that like for two weeks, you're working yeah. on verse one. Yeah, consider it a success to teach your kids one verse. Because rote of difficult language is takes a long time. Yeah. It's not that it can't be done. There's also just very few recordings of hymns. Oh. Yeah, yeah, there's not great recordings of so, hymns, which means it, it's hard to- um, it, The burden is on you as a parent to sing it over and over again or find a recording, which is just a little bit harder to do. So based on time, why don't you do this stuff okay. and then I'll take, I'm it's, gonna put it's stuff- pretty, it's, in, it's on the handout. Oh, it, you guys got a handout? I, link, I linked a handout in, oh, the, that's so in fancy. the chat. Okay, never mind. And there's several suggestions. Um, I, can sh I can share it here too. Let's let's just go through this real quick. Okay, so people see what we're saying. Oh, you made it's, it look so nice. No, too. Brian made it look oh. nice. So, if you, in the folk or early childhood, 
Arena, if you can get your hands on some music art or kinder music curriculum CDs, even on eBay, find those. They're just really, really nice. Similarly, Elizabeth Mitchell is on Spotify and all the streaming services. She has lovely folk albums with basic accompaniments and ranges that children can sing. If you're my age, then we had We Sing when we were kids and they have so many albums. The one that's Bible songs is all the songs that Steve's mom sings, sang to my babies when they were little, like Jesus loves the little ones like me, me, me. You know, the ones that have all the hand motions. Okay, this one's a little out there and this is a hyperlink. So if you take the, the thing, you can click on it. It's called Geography Songs. It is the cheesiest cr homeschool curriculum I have ever purchased in my life. And it is worth every $22 that you will spend on it. Um, it's literally songs about every part of the world just listing off the countries in those areas. And my kids know so much geography from those songs. And then in case you're interested in some more um, outside of white Midwestern experience, Jose Luis Orozco has lovely songs that kind of are a little bit bilingual and just a lot of Spanish, same exact genre, folk songs in Spanish if you want your kids learning a little bit of Spanish. Okay, and then specifically for Bible verse memorization, Sing the Word is a fantastic series. I believe the uh, wife of the guy who wrote all of them was an Eastman master's or doctorate in flute, and she plays on a lot of the albums, a lot of flute, um, but very melodic, long passages for some of this. The lower levels start with short verses, and then you get whole psalms, whole sections of epistles on the upper levels. Seeds Family Worship and Steve Green are both available on Spotify and such. And then these are specific. Okay, sorry, you talk right. now. I get to talk now. Sweet. Um, so these are this this set here under contemporary Christian music is our set of sort of um, music that kind of meets kind of that that vision of of melodic. Um, it's the kind of singing that you could take with you away from the recordings or away from church worship. I will just say this as I encourage this type of music, um, as we talk about like Teze and Iona community, for instance, you can't often completely switch the culture of your of your church's worship setting. Um, you don't wanna be that pest who's always telling your worship pastor what they should do. Steve, but are you saying that? That sometimes that happens, but, that happens? but like uh, Teze and Iona um, are two examples. And there's other people out there like John Michael Talbot, um, um, it's 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 all simple refrain singing. So Tizé community in France, it's just like these little eight bar um, antiphons, refrains that you just sing over and over again. Iona community is a very similar thing. A, a little of that in a church's diet is is really rich because that's the stuff that people um, remember. Um, and there's usually canter lines above them yeah. with more complicated text. Um, so more in terms of like contemporary recording artists, we're big fans of Fernando Ortega, especially some of his newer stuff for corporate worship. If you are kind of anti-contemporary music, I would invite you to to check out his Come Down, O Love Divine or his Shadow, Shadow of Your Wings. That's the one that I'm like over the moon about. Just really rich biblical yeah. singing, really simple melodies, just lovely stuff. Um, Paul Balash, specifically that album, that's way more in the contemporary zone. I'd also recommend Meredith Andrews, who isn't on this list. They just write simple melodies. Um, stuff you can sing. City Alight um, has several great albums. Some of their stuff can be really thick. Sometimes it can be a bit like the Gettys, which is lovely stuff, but like really thick and a lot of words, almost like a hymn, but they do write a lot of stuff with refrains. So, so notice we didn't have the Gettys on here and that's because they write too many words. And I love their songs, yeah. but for children, they yeah. write too many words. It's just, it's There's just, no refrains. It's hard to get your kids hooked on that and singing it again and again. It's great in corporate worship and it can yeah. be used, but. If you read, it's fine. But if you're trying to do anything from, from for younger children, that's really, really difficult. The next time I see Keith Getty, I'll ask him to might write more refrains. There you go, more yeah. refrains. Yeah. Okay, and then I, just as a little bonus, I put a whole bunch of, if you are not a classical musician or if you're not a church musician, just some kind of things to spark your um, imagination on what kinds of styles tend to be more singable. And so I have got a long list there. Now, this is all non-Christian and I'm not saying go find illicit lyrics. I, and you do have to keep in mind like, 
what your children sing and memorize does form them. So obviously all of this requires wisdom and discernment, but these are things that start off in a more safe zone lyric wise and are more melodic. And I enjoy listening to or singing around the house. And when we were preparing this list, Steve made the distinction of there's music in the more popular realm that we enjoy because it's musically interesting which is not necessarily good for singing. So yeah. just keep in mind, if you love Radiohead or something else that's musically interesting and well worth talking about, whether or not it's singable is a totally different thing. And if we're talking about training our children to sing, we wanna go more in that singable realm. Okay, so that, that PDF is in the chat and you're welcome to take it and click on any links that you want. Um, I think okay. that was, is that it? Do that's, you wanna, that's our content, Brian. We want to open it up for any questions. I'll just I'll just make one comment about my family. My my kids are a bit younger than yours, we, and um, but we've been singing more and more together since we've been home. So it's been good for us. And every Sunday morning before church, um, we have a little hymn sing, um, and so that's that's been good for our family, and we have a three-year-old and she knows two requests now her one request that she knows is holy 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 yes. you know not that she knows all the words right there's too many words but she knows to say holy 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 and and we thought that's all that she was going to request but now she knows the blood song and the blood song is a perfect refrain song nothing but the blood of jesus oh, there yeah. you go um, yes absolutely which fits into your model of refrain songs but that's right. known now as the blood song. blood song well we also have a friend whose son is three and totally obsessed with oh holy night and he knows both verses of oh holy and he just sings them on repeat because he's made his his mom sing them over and over again so <laughs> it's not like you don't ever end up with those things it's just that's not where you want to try to start um, because it's much more difficult and, and difficult to enter into. <laughs> but I wonder what other questions there are out there. Any other thoughts? Any questions from? It's fun to see some kids here. I love that Anna Swinford and the Ickeses are both here. You guys could have like a little wave reunion. <laughs> Sorry, it looks like it looks like Claire, uh, Claire, Claire has a. I have a question. Um, Anne is sick, so she took a late nap, so she's off with it. But um, our son John is going to be six, and he's got the impression that he can sing harmony by just deviating from the melody. Yes. <laughs> um, so we've started teaching him about rounds. Um, Good. My memory of learning rounds is like the it helps if you cover your ears while you sing and just barely hear the other person. Any any more tips on teaching rounds and singing? I've done, I've taught rounds before and the best thing to do is less about like not listening, but having a partner. So you have to have two or three on one side and two or three on the other, unless you've got you know an adult who can hold their own. Um, the other best round that's always taught in early childhood is uh, music alone shall live. I don't know, music alone shall live ever to die. That's another good one because um, it's just the three lines. There's other ones, but that's the one that I know I taught regularly. Of course, row, row, row your boat right. <laughs> works as well. We've got a dinosaur song from We Sing Dinosaurs. Yeah. Perfect. I like dinosaurs. <laughs> Yeah, rounds are rounds are awesome. That's, yeah, thank you for bringing that up. That's a great way to build. promote independence yeah. too. I I you said there aren't very good recordings of hymns, which we have found as well. But do you have any suggestions of record just a way? Because um, I feel like we play contemporary worship music, but the kids never hear hymns, well, except at church, and we don't there go to church. Actually, is a can you go find that book in your room? That's the hymns that has the CD. But do you know where that is? Um, the hymns book. I am not, I thought about this. Oh, no, I found it. Okay. Uh, ooh, that's a weird. Just do a little copy of the. No, I can just. She's so smart. Um, there is this series. I guess it's focused on the family. We own one of these 
Hymns for a Kid's Heart. It does come with a CD. Uh, oh yeah, that's right. Johnny Erickson Tata is on this. They are fully orchestrated. So you just have to know this is like a, it, it's not my favorite musical version of it, but the books are lovely, well illustrated. And it, Livia definitely, our daughter definitely learned a couple of hymn tunes from listening to that. And then it's easier to add words on top of it. I should go back and look at that so I can recommend or not recommend it. Yeah. Um, sometimes I find it more of a possibility to find fun recordings of hymns that are in a different style than like choir and organ. So I don't know if you've ever listened to like Maddie Pryor, um, Anna, that'd be one that'd be fun to check out. Um, kind of like, uh, what is that? Is that Irish folk? Kinda? Oh, that sounds like yeah. early American. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, that's good stuff. Um, and then I'm sure you've done this, Anna, but like, I actually like when I have a chance for my kids to hear at home um, him singing in a in a live context. So um, I think there's a BBC there's a BBC online uh, uh, link I could find um, that's all it's all even song. So you can listen to even song choral music, but you can listen to them sing sing, sing their congregational hymns and stuff like that too. That's been like our best experiences. Like when we listen to lessons and carols at home and the hymns are cranking from a live context, but it is, it's trickier, like at home recordings aren't quite. Um, the, if you enjoy early American hymnody or uh, Anglican hymnody, then the Boston Camerata, this is more of a like nerdy musician thing, but you, but it's not classical music and you, you could use some of their stuff if there's a hymn text in there that you enjoy. Um, Manny Pryor and Boston Camerata are the two that I that I like um, the sound of very folky sound. That makes me think though, you talking about the lessons and carols. I didn't say something about range with children after I talked about that early childhood range. Um, don't ever let anyone tell you that your child who has not entered adolescence yet is an alto because that is a flat out lie <laughs> from the devil. <laughs> Um, so you, just to make that really strong extreme, beliefs about that. <laughs> all children, all children are sopranos, yeah, all sing. of them. And if they cannot sing high outside of actual real physical, um, damage, damage done to their voice, it's simply that they have not used the muscle. And so any children's choir that your child participates in should be taking all children all the way up the, the range to like, I'm talking high C off the staff, really high. And just developing that muscle and teaching them descants. So that, that's what made me think of it. Our kids love descants. So they sing the same Hark the Herald Angels Sing and O Come You Faithful descants way up on top of the staff every year. And they just yeah. they just love it because they're ripping it on top. And they'll sing it in, um, in church. From their from, from the their own little seat, you know, because they know the desk can't because they memorized that in choir. And so um, singing high is a good thing. Singing high is very good. That's the essence. Very of good. Life. Yeah, that's what I'm going for. <laughs> Once you get past that early childhood place and you're developing, you're developing growing the muscles. Oh yeah, Anna, slugs and bugs is is fun. This is um post my oldest they came out after our oldest yeah, was you all would know that more age so <laughs> anything else so how important is like a, a children's choir experience do you think for oh man kids? well i mean it, it would it be really horrible to say it's it's really really valuable and it's really hard to find a good one because <laughs> that's kind of the that's kind of the thing I mean that was part of our vision for when we, we started we one. had to just do it ourselves yeah um yeah I mean if if you have a church um or like a community thing or you know, in our area, there's other churches that, that do great children's choirs. I would try to take advantage of that um, for your kid, um, especially in the zone from like seven years old-ish to like, puberty. to puberty. 
Um, it's just an awesome zone for that to be, you know, a big part of their, their music making. Yeah, there are, I mean, there are a lot, of, not in COVID clearly, but there's a lot of great, if you're in a major metropolitan area, there's a lot of great children's choir opportunities if you're willing to pay for that as, as one of your music education things, if your church is not, you know, able to provide that. And when COVID's over, we can't wait to get ours started back up. <laughs> Claire. Do you have, um, this is a little separate, but do you have good ways of encouraging children's participation in worship like at church oh not man. just like from your seat. yeah 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 um that's that's a good question we haven't done enough of this but um one of the things that's I been really slap my child and tell them to stand up no, no no i don't think she meant your individual child. not my individual okay, no. <laughs> i i uh i uh i um that was a joke we like to do things like teach a song to the kids in in their in in the kids program first and then have a, a point where we bring that song in and all the kids stand up front and, and, and kind of lead the congregation in it. Or like simpler versions where they already know a song or we do a kid's song that they love and we bring it. And I make a big deal of it when I do that. Like the, the kids and res kids have been, you know, uh, learning this song. Um, and then they get kind of all pumped up. We try to always do some of our regular worship music in the kids program so that what they're experiencing there, then, they, then they'll come in and when they're singing with the full congregation, they're familiar um, with some of the stuff as well. I mean, very occasionally, Steve will say from the front, kids, you're gonna have to help your parents with this one. If it's more of a, you know, upbeat. Oh, yeah, to have kind of fun, like give them leadership. Yeah. I also think, Anna, the idea of, you probably got a ton of ideas because you've been doing all this. I think your main worship leaders should make it into the rotation to go lead the kids. Um, I think that's a that's a really good one too. So then the kids have a, a, a direct connection with them as well. I like to write songs that are kind of for them, um, kind of become, become our thing. So when they see me in the in the sanctuary, we've kind of got our, our own connection as well. Claire, did you have something too? I did. I was wondering with children's choir, when do they need to be able to read music? When does that happen? Mm. That's obviously going to depend on the, um, whatever the context is and whoever the director is, um, for perspective, when I, when I did children's choir at res, we, our age limit was they had to be seven. So essentially second grade, but they had to be seven by that fall that they joined and I would always audition them not that I ever cut anyone but just so I knew if they could read words and then no they don't ever, hardly ever do they have to be able to read music because most directors assume that that's their role is as a music educator is to teach a child how to read um, music and then I always just if I had a child who didn't read English very well I just made it extremely clear to the parent that they were going to have to do work at home yeah. because the trying to intake music and words at the same time, as I've already said, is quite difficult for most children on the younger end of that spectrum. Um, but most choirs are not expecting a kid to come in and be able to sight sing. Uh, they will work on those, those skills. Just for context, if you're not a professional musician, sight singing, being able to look at a line of music and produce that with your voice is one of the hardest things to do. It's far more difficult than sight playing your instrument because most instrumentalists memorize patterns of fingerings and just know they don't have to literally produce that sound with their physical body. Yeah. Um, so it is, that's a much more refined skill than sitting down and playing notes. Um. I know so much of this is kind of like not directly in, in the zone of uh, singing in worship with your kids, but I think part of it is that creating kind of a singing culture in your family is really the, is really the, the root that we feel like elicits corporate participation from your kids. And from that standpoint, I would just say too, it's like, it's a long game like it's just constantly kind of building that culture with your family. So um, from that perspective, also like just 
give yourself grace and patience for, for where your kids are right now at this moment. Um, and if you hit COVID and all of a sudden it kind of feels like now we're doing this all the time and the kids don't participate and this is hard. It's like, I think there's a ton of grace um, on that because what you're really trying to do is disciple your kids over the, over the whole course of their, the time in your house that, that singing, if singing is a part of life, then singing in church will be um, something that they naturally want to participate in. And as a result, it'll be part of what disciples them um, in the church as well. And just to take it to take it out of the church context and just into a personal development context. My when I'm teaching piano, my goal besides giving my students a a love of music that I want them to take with them their entire lives is for them to develop their own personal expression and to be able to open themselves up to give the gift of their personal expression to an audience or to a family or anything like that. And so just giving a child tools to actually express themselves in, in a musical way is in and of itself a wonderful thing to do and to just model that that's what we do. We, we sing, we talk about our feelings, <laughs> we, we participate in corporate worship, like we are human beings with real feelings and real insides. And um, that's really important, I think, for our, our children in this generation to develop as just as much as the actual musical part of it. Well, thanks so much, Steve and Jana, for meeting with us and talking to us. Um, do you want to leave us your email address or anything if if we want to get in contact with you or yeah definitely um we're going to give you your email address. Um, and thanks for the handout link in the chat for the handouts and um but just thanks everyone for coming out this was uh fun for me to just see what what experience we could all share um doing music i'm, I'm sure many of us are in the same boat trying to figure out how to be at home much more than usual with with our family and it seems to me an important thing that we worship well together right, right? music in our family's life are there any good night songs that you guys sing do you guys sing any songs before bedtime you know the the music man good night ladies um, <laughs> somewhere okay. along the way, it just changed to the kid's name. So like our daughter's name is Livia. So it was good night, Livy. Good night, Livy. Good night, Livy. We, we hate to see you go. Whatever. That was the one that was perpetual in our house. That, that was, that was probably started by grandma. Probably. That was grandma probably Steve's mom. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And I, I know a lot of families have like practice of singing at bedtime. Um, um, our kids are older now. Yeah, we don't yeah. sing to them as much at bedtime. <laughs> they go to bed on their own. Yeah, now I'm now I'm drawing a blank. Yeah, that was really the big one. I I know it's so silly, but it's just like everybody can sing that. So, <laughs> for a while, I remember my, my sister's family used to sing Frosty the Snowman at bedtime every night. I'm oh. not sure why, but it's, you know, just goes to this thing, like every family oh has their own little habits that the kids, oh, yeah. you know, attach themselves to, and it becomes a family tradition, right? And exactly. And that way. Well, thanks. We'll let you all go and put your kids to bed <laughs> or back to bed in, in some of our cases. But um, thanks again for stopping by. Thank you, Steve and Jana, for sharing your ideas you, with Brian. us. And um, yeah, God bless you all as you sing with your families. So thank, thank you, you all. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everyone. Good.